Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, another QMNet talk, the Quantitative Methods Network here at the University of Melbourne. My name is Mike Zephyr, and I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Business and Economics. And today we've got a really exciting talk by the CEO uh, of Array Fire, John Melanakos. And uh, the talk is uh, The Array Fire Mission and Thoughts on a Future Shaped by Machine Learning and Internet Decentralization. Uh, and John is in a really good position. Uh, to talk to us uh, on these topics. John uh, is not just the CEO of ArrayFire, he's also a co-founder. And he and his co-founder co started ArrayFire in 2007 while completing their PhDs in medical image processing and computer vision and uh, spinning the company out of uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology. ArrayFire makes AI and GPU software to help scientists, engineers, and financial analysts build faster, smarter code. The ArrayFire library is an open source and effective way to make better computing applications with data parallel processors, uh, GPUs, obviously, um, but increasingly CPUs as well. ArrayFire is used by researchers in open source projects around the world, such as the new C++, C++ machine, le machine learning framework uh, Facebook's flashlight. John is a purpose-driven entrepreneur working on software tools for technical computing and has a keen interest in the decentralization of the internet and the role technology can play in promoting healthy communities, which we need more and more of, obviously, uh, <laughs> as time goes on. When not working, uh, enjoys uh, time adventuring with his six children. My goodness. <laughs> That is incredible. Uh, so I don't know how you time, have time to do anything else. Uh, thanks so much, Sean. We really appreciate this and take it away. Well, uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to share this talk with you guys. It's, uh, it's uh, I spent quite a bit of time putting together these ideas and I've structured this talk in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way where I have only a handful of slides but we're gonna surf the web together and I, I really would like this talk to be interactive where uh, feel free to stop me at any time. I, I, is, what's the, do people understand the mechanism to be able to ask questions or I guess you just, is there a way to yeah. holler at me? Uh, if anybody wants to chime in, I guess if, if you're happy with that. Yeah, yeah, just uh, just uh, unmute and, and, and ask a question, interrupt me. I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, I would like to have a, a dialogue going on here and uh, the be towards the beginning of the talk, I'm going to talk about things that, I've, that we've been doing for 14 years uh, and talks I've given uh, hundreds of times. Uh, and then as we progress, it'll get to stuff that's more and more new. Some of, and at the end, the, the final section will be things that are brand new. This is my first time presenting on them. Uh, it, it, these are uh, some of the ideas we've been working on over a year. And so this is sort of our first public disclosure of the things that we're doing. Um, so Array Fire, we've talked about uh, where uh, I'm located in Atlanta. That's where our headquarters is. Uh, we originally spent out of Georgia Tech. Uh, he introduced myself. Uh, I, I believe my co-founder is on this in this meeting, or if he's not, he's on his way, uh, Gallagher Pryor. Uh, uh, he's the original inventor of, of what has become Array Fire the library, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Um, and when he, when he shared, as we were PhD students back in 2007, he, he, shared, he shared these concepts with me on a walk to lunch, and I said, I think I can sell that. And so together we sort of, I, I took more of a business hat, and he took more of a, a CTO hat, and we, we co-founded the company. Uh, like, like Mike said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a busy dad. And, and, and in fact, uh, as we get towards the end of this, my children are actually pretty involved in, in, in discussions and thinking through some of the things that, that we're building. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting and, and exciting time to sort of merge uh, home life with business life um, a little bit. Uh, and you'll see, you'll see how that makes sense in a little while. Uh, I, I did my bachelor's at BYU and, and graduate work at Georgia Tech. So uh, the overview of the talk today is sort of three layers. I want to talk about uh, work that we do with a tensor library called Array Fire. Um, I'm going to talk about a, 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 la a layer of application for a machine learning library called Facebook's Flashlight, uh, which is I share as an example of 
of, of a major project that that's being built on top of array fire and how that works. And then finally, I'm just going to end with some ideas and some thoughts for applications that could be built on that stack that are really cool and things that I've been thinking about quite a bit that uh, that are a, a departure in some ways from the things that we're doing at Ray Fire, but but uh, but building on that same stack, it's uh, it's potentially a, 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 a something that we could go explore in another open source project. Um, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna start uh, talking about Array Fire itself, and just to give you some example of things that people are doing with Array Fire today, we have uh, DARPA, which is a, a military agency in the U.S. Uh, that has a database of six uh, over six million images, and, and it does. They're using Array Fire for real time object and uh, object detection and uh, object and individual detection. The Department of Energy. Uh, does real-time and uh, network analysis of packets. Uh, the company glasses.com, I think they sell 90% or more of all sunglasses and, and eyeglasses in the world. Uh, they, they have an app that you can virtually try on glasses. Uh, we built that app for, uh, for them. And uh, Disney had a, a special uh, a special effect that they were working on that had a uh, massive images at a very high throughput to do some uh, 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 tracking of, a, of an individual in a Broadway play. And that was, that was a fun project. And uh, Sleep Med, they, they do sleep analysis studies and uh, there are uh, 96,000 hours of data daily that uh, need to be processed and we were able to through acceleration, reduce the, the footprint of, of, the, of the amount of, of computing uh, expenditure that they needed. Okay, so, so you, each of you should have received uh, by email the, a set of links. And rather than recreate slides from content that's already published, uh, I figured this talk would be helpful to just sort of visit those websites together and I'll and I'll and I'll just skim through them with you, and to introduce the material. So again, we're we're going to step through three different things. We're going to talk about array fire, and then the machine learning framework from Facebook, and then ideas for a social network. That's the uh, that's the structure of the talk. Um, you, you you can still see my screen, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So the ArrayFire mission is to develop open source software for the advancement of science and technology through the delivery of the fastest, meaning speed, and most productive library for tensor computing. Um, so so, so we, everything we do, we want to have our functions be the fastest possible functions given a hardware uh, architecture uh, possible. And the goal of the library is to provide something that's vendor neutral. So, so, so that's something that immediately is, is different than what the hardware manufacturers will ever provide because each hardware manufacturer, tend, they tend to historically only build things that run on their own chips. All, albeit that is changing with one API from Intel uh, in the near future. Um, so it's to provide something that's vendor neutral, easy to use, and um, while maintaining the core focus on top performance. So at, uh, rather than having our users code at the level of CUDA or one API or OpenCL, those are lower level frameworks for heterogeneous computing. We offer an array based notation that's easier, uh, easier to program. And, and, and so there, there's four main commitments here, these bullet points. The, the first one is to be, have a high utility to technical computing to, pro, to, to essentially provide a set of functions that's broad enough that you can do math, science, and engineering projects of all sorts. Also to provide those functions with different wrappers for popular languages like C, C++, Fortran, Python, Rust, 
there's 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 many others. There's Julia rappers. Um, uh, so to, to be just as useful as possible to technical computing. Uh, we have a commitment to, to hardware vendor neutrality, which, which means we, we want to always run on the most popular heterogeneous computing frameworks. But if you program with array fire, you write your code in an array based notation that's similar to something like NumPy or MATLAB. Uh, you write it in this higher level notation. And then by virtue of using the library, you can actually run that on CUDA, OpenCL devices, or even the CPU itself without having to change any of your code. You just, and I'll show, we'll, we're, as part of this meeting, we're actually run together um, um, some array fire code uh, on, on Google's cloud, and you'll see how that works. Uh, e easy to use, that, that vector notation is, is really so much faster to program than lower level um, than, than, than C or C++, for instance, or, or, low, or lower CUDA level details. Um, let's see, top performance. So our commitment is to write the, the fastest code possible and, and it's an open source project. So when people are able to beat some uh, speed on on safe uh, convolution. Well, then we look. Th then our goal is to provide an, an easy organization by which submissions come in, and we're able to integrate the fastest code that people develop uh, in the pro in the open source project. Okay. <clears throat> now the second link uh, is to the documentation. And I just wanted to skim through this documentation real quick so you can see what's available. If you click on functions, you can go to functions by category and you can sort of scan through here and see things that might be relevant to, to your work and to the things that you do. Uh, computer vision, uh, things that modify and create arrays, image processing, uh, linear algebra functions, machine learning functions, math functions. Uh, there's a memory manager in array fire that, that, that behind the scenes does, a, does an excellent job at minimizing memory transfers, which is where a lot of the compute bottlenecks are in, in, in various heterogeneous uh, systems. Uh, there's signal processing functions, statistics functions, and, and vector algorithms. So just a sort of a base layer of, of functions that you can use then to, to architect whatever sort of application you want. Uh, you can go to the tutorials as well. Uh, here it's sort of, there's an introduction to vectorization, which is helpful uh, and, and shows you how to, uh, lots of examples of how to, how to program for parallel computing. It's it, part of the trick in getting code to run in parallel is to get it to run on the device and understanding all the device stuff. The other part is to actually just write the code itself structurally in a, in a parallel way. And, uh, and this is some tutorial for that. The array fire comes with a G for loop, which is uh, a parallel for loop. If, if the, iterations of a loop are not data dependent, then you can uh, parallelize it with G4. And there's, there's a, a, a batching function as well uh, that, that lets you uh, do things in parallel with that notation. I'll let, let's see here. <clears throat> I think that's enough for here, but I, I if you're interested and want to learn more and, and, and start using Rayfire, you can dive in and, uh, and learn, learn a lot more through that link. Okay. Uh, the case studies link is just, a, uh, shares a lot of examples of, of success stories that people have had. Uh, like I sort of shared at the beginning of the talk with the, with a handful of of, uh, of larger projects that have achieved a lot of speed up through a ray fire. And in fact, we're doing a, a project um, 
with Mike and with you guys to to accelerate some of your your code as well. And we're excited to see the results of that. Okay. Um, the other the other thing I just want to mention is. It's not enough to create a library like a Ray Fire just to go build CUDA functions or OpenCL functions for a convolution for, for all these for all those map functions. It's not enough just to build uh, versions of those map functions that run on the device. What you also have to build is a just-in-time compiler that takes all of the functions that you're doing and tries to put as many of those functions into a kernel launch um, uh, or an, execu an, an execution of code across the data. You wanna batch as much computation into one memory fetch as possible to, to, to avoid memory transfers for every uh, atomic function, for instance. And so ArrayFire does that behind the scenes. It's not something that you, you worry about as a user, you just write your code. But behind the scenes, ArrayFire has actually taken all of those functions, merging them together into beefy kernels, which is a good thing. That means you do a lot of computation with only one fetch from memory and one store back to memory. Um, um, so so that's, there's, a, there's a lot of tricky bookkeeping and keeping things all uh, all sort of straight so that the results come out properly uh, to make that happen and that's 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 one of the one of the reasons that array fire has sort of been highly used a lot of people have tried to build gpu computing libraries i'm not aware of any other library that's ever actually successfully done a, a, a done the bookkeeping in quite the same way Okay, let's let's play with it. So, if you go and click on the uh, Google Colab, you can follow along with me. This first function I've already run on my machine because it takes a couple of minutes. It's got to go. Uh, uh, so, oh, I should step back and say, uh, Google offers collaboratory Google Colab, which is a free uh, GPU capable cloud environment for programming in Python. So that's what we're in right here. This is a this is a a Google uh, Drive file that's shareable, just like a, any other Google Drive file, and in it you can run code. So the first the first block of code installs a Rayfire into your GPU computing instance, and then you're set. And then and then once it's installed, uh, we can start running code. So. Uh, I'll, while, while yours is loading and you can play with it, I'm just going to keep going with my uh, with my presentation, and uh, and you can follow along. So th the first thing we're going to do here is set the back end to CUDA, um, and then we're uh, we're going to print some information. So I'm going to run this. So when you when you run uh, when you print the uh, af dot info, you get the ArrayFire version, uh, and it tells you things about the system. In this Google Cloud instance, I have a Tesla K80. Um, and then I, we created some ra a, a three by three matrix of random numbers that's below. So now we're gonna uh, do something. This is actually a, a function that when, when, when we first started this conversation a couple months ago uh, uh, with Mike, we learned, or, or uh, I, th I think you wanted to test P inverse, if I, if, if I recall. And uh, yeah, that's right. So we're going to actually right. benchmark this. Yeah, we're going to benchmark this right now, just just as we did uh, at that time. And we're going to create random a random uh, thousand rows and twenty column matrix, and then do the pseudo inverse and time it. So when you, the first time that you run uh GPU code it, it the, the, the the system the first iteration of the loop takes uh, more time to launch the kernel and then in subsequent iterations there's a caching system so that it doesn't have to uh, do some of the on the fly compilation 
that it did in the in the in the first spot. So I'm a, if you if you run it the first time, it's it's because it, it's only running a handful of loops. It says five point nine or five point oh nine milliseconds per loop. But if you if you run it again, it, that should go down. Yeah. Yeah. So now any time any subsequent time you run it, it it goes much slower. Um. Then you can switch the to the CPU, and now we're going to time the same exact function using a ray fire, but now it's going to run on the CPU in the in the instance instead of the GPU, and let that run. So that's and if we run that again, that should stay about the same 29, 29 milliseconds per loop on the CPU. 3.8 milliseconds per loop on the on the GPU. And run that again, and that should stay more or less the same. <clears throat> okay, and then this uh, is there. If you have any questions, again, feel free to uh, jump in and and ask anything you want. You can go through and and change. If you want to look at some other function that you just know is slow in in uh, whatever, Wait. this should tab complete, I think. No, oh, maybe not. Oh, there it is. Yeah, you can you can select any any of these uh, functions and um, and benchmark them and just you know, swap out the same function on that line for the GPU and on that line for the CPU, and you can time things. This is a simple tutorial that, that uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because this is just sort of straightforward stuff about programming in a vectorized language, but you can, uh, you can get a, a sense for the functions are, are really similar to NumPy or, or, or MATLAB, like I said earlier. Where, where it's a vectorized programming structure. And uh, in the interest of time, I'll let you, I'll let you look through that on your, on your own. Okay. Okay, so we've covered those links and that, that was the, that was, that's a nutshell of, uh, of what a Rayfire is as an open source project. And uh, if you're interested in using it or have any questions, you can feel free to follow up with me after the talk. Uh, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, Facebook just sort of popped up out of nowhere with, with, with a, a group that started building a, a machine learning framework in C++. Uh, and they wanted it to be sort of a lightweight, much faster version of PyTorch. And this is called Flashlight. Um, so let's go to the those links uh, flashlight here. So this is this is again. Uh, so that was a couple of years ago, and and since then it's it's actually grown to be quite an initiative within Facebook. It's 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 highly modular. Uh, people people like that they can program in in a ray fire instead of having to program in in, in the in CUDA and in the much bigger and more complicated system that is PyTorch. <clears throat> and, and this was, this is just, they, they're a great partner with us. We, we speak to them almost daily uh, and have a, have, have a close relationship. But Flashlight is a fast, flexible machine learning library written entirely in C++. Uh, its core features are just-in-time kernel compilation with the ArrayFire library. Uh, they had, and again, since it's in, since they're building on top of a ray fire, they automatically get CUDA and CPU backends for GPU and CPU training, and uh, the whole project is is has an emphasis on efficiency and scale. Uh, there's some really cool apps that they've that have already been developed that uh, they have aut automatic speech recognition coming out of this project image classification, object detection, and language modeling. And, uh, and they, they, the number of people working at Facebook on this project is, is 
probably more than we have even on a ray fire at this point they they've they've added quite a few developers um here, here's some of the main ones that are that are working uh to build this to build this project so we're we're super excited about that uh here's an example the next link of uh the fastest state-of-the-art speech system uh, was built through F flashlight um and uh I'll leave that for you to, to review if that's something that's interesting to you. Okay. I'll hop back here. So uh, just to go back to this picture, we've talked about array fire. We've talked about flashlight. And the reason I wanted to bring out the flashlight is, is because array fire, that's just an example of someone that took array fire and, uh, Use the open source license and to 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 to, to build their own project. Uh, we have people doing that in all sorts of industries and different sorts of projects, and uh, it's something to consider if you're if you have compute bottlenecks and you want to have something that that's not only easy to program but will stay uh, relevant without code modification into the future. Meaning the API of ArrayFire doesn't change. What changes is the hardware vendor's implementation of, of CUDA or one API or OpenCL. That's a highly turbulent world. Every couple of years, things are much different than they were, uh, uh, you know, a couple of years before that. Uh, so to stay sort of impervious to those hardware vendor changes ArrayFire is a good way to shield against that because we update the library and we do all that that ongoing work of staying at the top, you know, staying keeping pace with the innovations that the hardware vendors are, are making and applications that build on top of ArrayFire don't, all, all they have to do is upgrade the library that they link to, they don't have to change the, the actual code itself. Um, the, the, the math functions and the, the API there stays static. Okay, uh, let me go back here. <clears throat> uh, while, while we're on the topic of machine learning, I, I wanted to talk, uh, move the, start talking now about more philosophical things and present some ideas uh, on trends in computing around machine learning and around internet decentralization that I think are, are highly relevant to the kinds of software that's going to be developed and it, sooner than we think I, uh, is my gut feeling on this is uh, we are moving we are right now sort of at the at the nexus between web 2 and web 3 and I'll explain more about what that means in a little while but the 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 four the four these trends are 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 really powerful and and I think have application to areas of computing and the internet that 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 I few people I think currently are are thinking about how the world is going to change because of these trends and and so this is more of a again philosophical it's 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 what I see personally. I might be wrong, and I would love for people to point out where I am wrong because that's it's that that's my goal here. Is I I know that I'm with a, a group of extremely smart people, and um, and I'm going to present the structure as I th see things, and these are just ideas. I'm not sure if they are will work, but please please chime in and and give perspective and, and correction where it's needed. Um. But in 2006, uh, what? So I've I have this phrase, this refrain in my head that data is the new currency, and I I tried to look that up today and find out who said data, who originally said data is the is the new currency uh, when speaking of machine machine learning, and it's actually the it goes back to the statement in 2006. Uh, we don't need to go to that blog, but but. The, a guy said, "This is the data is the new oil. Um, it's something 
that when you when you have it and you when you're sitting on a pile of data it turns out that it's much 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 more valuable than when in in the early 2000s when we were constructing the internet as we see it today in web 2 uh i don't we we didn't really realize what the value of all of our clicks of of all of our web traffic of all of the photos that we upload uh, of all the tags that we put on our photos, we didn't. No one was really thinking about how valuable that is and who we're giving that value to. Um, now that it's with machine learning, it sort of flips that on its head, and it, and it causes one to sort of think: is is the structure that we built actually the right structure or not? What and and what things recognizing that data is the new oil, what things should change about the way that we've built the internet uh, uh, to, to, to make things more just logical and, and, and reasonable. Um, to just today on NPR, there was a, uh, let's go over here, it just uh, an article about China hacking into US computers through a Microsoft hack and which is something that happens from time to time. But, but the, the, the point of this article is that the reasoning behind some of these hacks might be more than just spying. It might actually be that they're collecting as much, much, as much data as they can and they have very intense initiatives to build, they, they want to lead the world in machine learning models and collecting as much data as they can, even if they have to steal that oil, essentially, from other people's computers. Um, that's, that's something that was on all things considered today. And I thought that was uh, a, timely, a timely piece given this talk. Um, Andrew Ng, who's one of the, one of the main leaders of, of machine learning and AI, uh, out of Stanford, and also a, an early Rayfire customer back when we used to sell software, he, he bought uh, many, many licenses from us for his Stanford lab. Um, he, he is going around in, in recent, I don't know how long he's been doing this, maybe a year, telling people that data is food for AI, that, that when you step back and look at what's going on in machine learning, the curation of the data and the, and the attention to getting the right data is actually almost all of the work of producing a good machine learning model. It's not in, it's not, especially as time goes on and these networks get more, get more um, solidified and, and, and less research or, or just more standard, it, it really will be the effort in the data and the, the, both the data generation, the data uh, labeling and all of those things uh, that will be the way in which the value is actually created out of the machine learning system. And that, that the, these key points that I'm, uh, I'm making and I'm, I'm sharing with you in trends are, are sort of the assumptions upon which I'm I'll, I'll make later later suggestions for ways to change the internet. <clears throat> okay, let's go back to the... Okay, so now let's talk about internet decentralization and we'll see how that, the concepts of machine learning tie heavily into the concept of internet de decentralization. Um, when you start considering the, 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 the relevance of, uh, especially of data as a currency. And, and when, when data is generated, um, so, so I, I wrote a blog post, that's the first link uh, called The Compelling Vision of Internet Decentralization. And in, the, in this blog post, I essentially question the value of our digital data uh, that di when, when be before 
an individual is even born in this world, digital data is created about that about that person. And it just starts there and keeps going every day until you die. And that's called, it's a digital footprint, a, a digital shadow, some people call it. The more and more that data becomes valuable and useful and the more and more our lives intertwine with the internet and with computing devices, the more that data is actually sort of sacred to the individual. That's how I feel about it anyway. And I, I'm not trying to say anything too crazy there other than we might reconsider the economics behind how we treat our data and who has our data and who gets to profit from uh, using our data to develop an economic uh, 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 reward. And so I'll, I'll, I'll let you, you can read through that if you want on, on your own time. But, um, but the internet today, essentially we built an internet where we give all our data to a relatively very small handful of people that can, that founded and control major, major tech companies that are worth upwards of, you know, I think the top five tech companies are worth $20 trillion, something like this, uh, in just five companies. <clears throat> and which, which I'm all for entrepreneurial success. I, 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 uh, it, love all of that and I don't think anyone I don't think any of them uh, intended to have this sort of runaway wealth but we've built this power structure where now with especially in the face of machine learning where the companies these those companies have the data we do not and not all, and they can harvest, they can build things faster than we can just by virtue of holding our data and, and, and you can think through some of the fairness and, uh, and, and freedom issues that come with that. So along comes, to the next link, along comes decentralization, which is, the four, is, is, is what people are looking to to sort of uh, correct uh, the errors that were uh, uh, built into the, into the web too. So this is one of the most popular articles from 20, in 2018 published from uh, Chris Dixon. Uh, he talks about the first two eras of the internet, web one and web two, um, and then to web three, which is uh, the, the era of decentralization, uh, starting most notably currently in, in cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance and moving rapidly into decentralized social networks. There are a number of them that have already emerged. And, uh, and, but these principles can really be applied to almost any application where, um, let's see. So he makes this point, why decentralization? And in web two, in these centralized platforms, uh, like a, like a, like the top tech, tech companies we have today, over time, the platform starts out attracting users when, it, when the growth is low, but as the growth increases and as the network, um, uh, I forget what the phrase is, but essentially you, when, when everybody's networked into the same thing, you, you, you have some barriers to entry for other competing com competitors to to, 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 to do, to replicate the same thing, they move from attracting to extracting value from, from the platform's users. And that's what we're seeing in a lot of, uh, for instance, the social, uh, the, the social dilemma, uh, documentary on Netflix is, is highly relevant to, to, uh, depicting how a focus on advertising is, is really doing more extracting value from users than adding value to users. And the platform's uh, relationship to, to complements to other developers, creators, businesses, it starts out with a, co a cooperative nature and ends up in a, co a competitive nature. Um, and 
it's not it's not clear how decentral so so how do you take how do you compete with something like the big internet companies today in a decentralized way uh, he, he, he says decentralized networks can win the third era of the internet for the same reason they won the first era by winning the hearts and the minds of entrepreneurs and developers and that's something I'm passionate about is just just sort of explaining these concepts in ways that are tractable that, that are motivational and and that show people how there is there is a there is some a lot of value and virtue in, in moving to web3 um, okay move forward <clears throat> the so so there how, how do you decentralize something well on july 1st the state of wyoming in the u.s became the first state to legally uh allow people to to uh, incorporate an llc that's a distributed autonomous organization a dao um, distributed autonomous organizations uh, are governed by smart contracts, and, and, and we'll, we, we, we can talk about that in a little bit. But, um, but in Web 1, companies created money, and companies earn the money. In Web 2, people create the content, and companies earn the money. And in Web 3, people it pushes that power back out to the people. People create content, people earn money. Um, this is uh, uh, Vitalik, who's the founder of Ethereum. I'm gonna play like a, a, a minute little clip here where he talks about smart contracts. So you, 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 have an, you develop, you can found a company that's a distributed, autonomous organization governed by a smart contract. And here, here's how smart contracts work. Right, so the general notion of a smart contract is that it's like a computer program that directly controls digital assets. You know, the kind of direct control here is important, right? It's not a computer program that makes a recommendation to a guy about how the guy should control the digital asset. It's a computer program that controls the digital asset. Like on Ethereum, you can literally send a bunch of Ether into a computer program. And once you've done this, the computer program itself has basically the unilateral ability to control, you know, where the money goes. If the computer program sends the money to address A, it goes to address A. If it wants to send it to address B, it goes to address B. And if it doesn't want to send it anywhere at all, then the money just stays there. And you can see this is used in a bunch of applications like insurance, just like any kind of self-executing financial contract, you can reduce counterparty risk in a lot of those kinds of applications by potentially a really huge amount. I mean, you could imagine it being used for even for more complex things. So there's this idea of DAOs, which are these entire long running entities that hold on to digital assets and basically use those digital assets in various ways according to these and a fairly complex sets of rules. I promise that all these concepts are going to come together in a second, but uh, but uh, let's go back to the slides. I think we've, yeah, we are. Okay, so there are many different uh, decentralized social networks that are already coming out. A lot of them are uh, in response to uh, the U.S. Uh, well, uh, they were being built before, but but a lot of their uptick in users is in response to some of the uh, 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 uptick in in censorship and in um, and in the moderation of of the major social networks today. Um, what what we've been what we've been working on for over a year is to develop a, a plan for a decentralized social network that we've been calling Zion, though that name is, uh, we, we may or may not stick with the name, but that's, uh, that's, that's what we've been calling it. When I first, um, when I first was invited to give this talk, uh, Mike said something to the effect of uh, that, that uh, it's a computing talk, but that there are, that, Try to find ways to make it relevant for behavioral and social scientists that might tune in and listen to this. 
And what's interesting about these mechanisms of decentralization, especially, is that you have the organization of a human endeavor, an LLC, that's governed by a piece of software, a smart contract that is, is a really important to get that thing right or the whole thing falls apart. But if you do get it right, then you have a, a very clean way to govern something. And, and so there's a big, there's a huge opportunity. This is for the, the behavioral and social scientists in the room. That is a huge opportunity to have input into uh, 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 building these sorts of systems that are that have a highly social component, but are gut, but ultimately lead to a, a a a software program that governs uh, some human enterprise. That's 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 super fascinating. So if we think about here, <clears throat> the the rest the rest of the talk is all in my slides. It's just uh, I think five or six slides left. Uh, centralized social networks today, this is what we have. So uh, you have, uh, again, you, you have some sort of machine learning support that goes into it, into the social network where you have a bunch of users. Ad dollars come into the tech company and the tech company sends advertisements uh, out to the users. That's a model that you all understand already. Uh, the big problem to me, and I think it's relevant, uh, everyone sort of sees this, is that, that that focus, that structure is not leading to healthy relationships. Uh, the, the people at the tech company, it seems, I, I'm sure they, 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 you know, I'm sure they do um, some effort in, in helping our relationships, but, but it feels like their focus is on delivering the most crisp, adds to the most targeted uh, chunks of users possible their customer is the advertisers not the uh not the users not the relationships that are getting affected in the social network and and decentralization potentially has the option to flip that on its head and to have an open source government with open so uh principles of, 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 a de of a democracy of temporary leaders that come in and, and focus entirely on what, well, it, well in, in, my, in my vision, again, I'm presenting my vision of a social network that could do, that could be powerful in replacing and, and becoming better for the world than, than a lot of the social networks that we have today. What if the leaders of the social network were entirely focused 100% on helping build healthy relationships? That would be a really interesting uh, uh, um, 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 network. Of course, of course, people in the network are trying to have fun. They're, they're in the network for all sorts of reasons. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the government would have, you know, you want to stay relevant, you want to build something that's, that's useful, but potentially you could build a social network that's sort of the place that people come to, 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 live, their, to live their most important life, where they connect with their actual immediate family members and communicate with their immediate family members, share, share their life together with their closest friends, and and just two ideas, just off the top of my head, two, two simple things that any social network could have already done that no one has done, and I don't understand why, but you could, a social network could have a little um, uh, a notification if you haven't sort of spoken to or, or reached out to one of your family members or friends in some time. It would be helpful for me. I would like to know if there's someone I've been neglecting. That's a simple thing to implement. That 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 if a if a if a network was fully does, uh, fully focused on helping build healthy relationships, maybe that's something they would put into the network. Another one is uh, with with machine learning and these language models that we have. You could have a a sort of text box to the side of the of the input text. Uh, so as you're typing a post, you could. You could have a little machine learning thing that that rewrites what you're saying in a different tone, 
and maybe you say something, maybe you say it a little bit more nicely. Maybe you, maybe you say it a little bit more flirtatiously. I don't know. But potentially you, you, you could get creative. And if you had uh, some, some uh, behavioral scientists working on that, I'm sure they could come up with some really interesting options for things that could, could be used as a tool by, by the uh, users of the network to, to, build their, to, to build better relationships. Uh, you can still take, and then also you can flip the whole um, wealth, the, flip the wealth back out to the people that are actually creating the wealth. Again, it's the users, it's not the leaders, it's the users that are creating the whole value of the network and creating the whole value of their data by which the algorithms are trained to, uh, to enrich. And it just seems like flipping that on its head makes a lot of sense to, to push the value back out to, to, to the user. So for instance, maybe these ad dollars still come in, but you don't send the advertisement into the application that modifies the application and focuses on eyeballs and time in the app. In fact, you potentially want to minimize uh, time in the app and, and just you know uh, uh, have more prudence there. Um, but that's all sorts of things that the, the, the open source government, le those leaders could just make decisions like that for the app that are fully sort of aligned with, with things that are healthy um, um, for the app, but then push out the push back to the value. I put 90% there. I don't know what the actual percentage would be, but it, it, uh, uh, you, you run you run this government enterprise on part of the on, on, on part of the advertising dollars, and what what normally would have been shareholder value returned, you could potentially use in interesting ways to enrich the people in the network itself. Okay, as we go along here again, I'm presenting ideas, and some of them get a little bit more queasy as you go along. But this is the final concept I'm going to present here that you could <clears throat> potentially take that excess ad dollar that you want to return to the users, you could return it to them through a new altcoin that's built into the app. When you sign up, you get a, a cryptocurrency wallet that's, that's uh, uh, innately paired with your profile and through good behavior in the network, and that can be, that good behavior can be defined, and you could uh, by the it's the, it would be defined by the leaders and released in sort of seasons of the app, for instance. But um, you could mine this new cryptocurrency that's backed by the reserve of of excess ad dollars that's coming in, so it immediately has real world value in this cryptocurrency. And you could promote super healthy behaviors in the network using the money to do that, and um, and, and sort of tie it all together. Uh, not all, uh, then also you're bringing people into the world of cryptocurrency and and decentralizing people's behaviors, giving them access and total control of their own data, and and and, and removing the intermediaries of all sorts in, that that get in the way and steal value or you know harvest value I should say from their, their from the work that people are doing in their own lives and so so that's a, that's a that's a potentially it's something that could be very helpful so we've been thinking we've been thinking through all these ideas this is the structure that we've come up with so far and now uh, this is something that we're going to launch as some as, as essentially a second startup it's uh, uh, it, it'll be a, its own op open source project. It'll be something uh, we I just started about a month ago, uh, speaking to investors and, and seeking to raise money on this concept. Uh, interestingly, just a week ago, I think yesterday, surprise, somebody released a decentralized social network named Zion, <laughs> which is nuts. Um, and it's really, it, I, it's fantastic, actually. And it's built on Bitcoin. Um, it doesn't have 
some of the feature it doesn't have for instance this this feature where the the it's trying to promote healthy relationships and good behavior but it does have it does have a, a lot of the essence of what we're working on and it's an open source project too so that that might be something that we go uh we certainly are going to reach out to these to that group and uh and see uh, it, we we might have to change our name to something else if it's if we're not aligned in our in our missions. If we are aligned in our missions, then maybe we work together with with uh, with this group. It's um, coming out of Boston, Texas. And with that, I I just want to I, I I can't do a talk without pr promoting uh, uh, the way that we make our money, which is through consulting services and training services. If if uh, if you have projects that are slow and you don't want to speed them up yourself and you have resources to spend on it, we're happy to uh, come in and help you. And with that, I, that's it. I'd like to thank uh, my whole team, uh, some of which are probably on this call. And uh, I encourage everyone to follow the Balaji uh, Srinivasan, who is on Twitter. He's the best thought leader I've seen in, uh, in res with respect to decentralization and to Web3 that's coming. And then those are some of my personal links. And with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. Well, thanks, John. That's a nice mixture of topics um, uh, spanning, obviously, computing and, and, and some kind of prospective potential uses of distributed computing. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to, uh, to jump in. I always like to give other people a chance before I start hogging, yeah. hogging the speaker's time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, <clears throat> so that talk brings up a number of um, yeah, interesting ideas. Um, one of them, one of them for me, I mean, just kind of you know, on the on the topic of of uh, this kind of net three point the idea of a distributed. Um, uh, kind of network and 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 kind of governance and power sharing structure, uh, which I think is implied there, right? So power exactly. is right. Power is transferred um, from kind of singular entities that are companies. That's kind of an old, an old right. organizational structure, um, but it has a legal foundation. Obviously, it's treated as a person, and 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 so one of the things that you're saying is in Wyoming, for example, they're creating a new legal structure for yes. um, for different organizational forms. And so, uh, in order to create this, it seems like a bunch of things need to need to fall into place. And so, one would be a legal structure. Um, others would be um, obviously computing. And so they're, you know, whether it's based on um, um, specific machine learning algorithms or whatever it is, right? There's there's a kind of um, technological infrastructure that's required. Um, but one of the things I was wondering is, uh, in terms of governance and some of the underlying kind of values or institutions that end up being um, kind of a foundation for what you were describing. Uh, the idea that, for example, ad revenue would would still be an important part of it, um, and I'm not saying that that is a necessary implication of what you're saying. That's just yeah. making an inference. Like if we make an inference based on what we see today, then you would have, if you want to generate revenue, then it's something like ads, right? Because that's that's the way right. a lot of these companies make money. So it's hard to predict what we would do other than that because the examples we have, like Google, or whatever. Um, yeah. So that ends up still, though, basing everything on a particular kind of uh, modern capitalist ad based, you know, uh -huh. selling, selling yourself, selling yourself as data um, yeah. form. And I'm wondering if we were to move beyond what we see today, instead of it being based on ads, what do you think, what do you think yeah. would so, serve as a monetary so, foundation? <clears throat> so when we, when we first formalized this idea, I rejected ads from the get-go. I, you know, once I saw that 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 social dilemma documentary and started thinking more about it, I was like, "Hell no, ads are terrible." Um, I, and if you were to do it without ads, you would essentially have to do it like open source projects are operating today, where you seek out benefactors, right. and, and and essentially you 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 
you need to find some some wealthy individuals uh, uh, or organizations to contribute, uh, which can be, which absolutely can be done, especially with a with a with a mission to go help solve some of the world's major problems. There, there are that's that's what philanthropies are built for. Um, so, so I, I think I, per, I I presented it to to this group as ads because that's a straightforward thing that ties it into the previous world it doesn't have to be ads it can be any 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 way in which you attract money to the project comes in and and basically would come in under the same concept where a portion is used to run the operations of the project fully public financials down you know with the most transparency possible and then and then, um, and then, and then, use the value again to to kick to either, as, uh, yeah, to kickstart the the cryptocurrency in some way. I mean, it's kind of interesting, right? Because uh, <clears throat> we have this problem um, with uh, trying to get. I mean, globalization has created a problem wherein you have um, this kind of big disjunction between the role of states, like governments. Um, which are not international, and uh, and corporate players or actors that are international oh, right. and are able to do all kinds of things in multiple currencies, et cetera. And so, uh, so, so they're motivated by profit to a large extent. Um, and so, uh, and so, you can't really go to a corporation and say fund this thing because that's not in their interest. And you can't really go to a government. Right. You can't really go to a government and say fund this thing because it's not in their purview. And so it's right. almost I mean, it's almost be begging for a new institutional form. And that new institutional form could be just like a government does. It could be, you know, it just why not generate its own profit de novo or its own currency, like you're saying. So, like, for example, the United States prints money. They can just print money yeah. and put it out there. And the only thing they have to worry about are things like inflation, exchange rates, et cetera. So it's right. not based on anything. The currency isn't based on anything except yeah, people. Exactly, yeah. Right. You, people just treat the currency if it, as if it's worth something. And it is. That's what makes it worth something. It's not based on the value of production. It's not based on the value of gold. It's just based on the fact that people use it. And so yeah. if, right, and so you don't need corporations and you don't need governments if you can, and you don't need ad revenue, if you can just make your own currency that people use. Yeah. And so then that's it. And maybe, and maybe that's, I'm just wondering, like, instead of ads, what do we have? We can't use governments, yeah, we can't no, I, use companies. I, 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 exactly. I, I think the way to build something like this that I'm proposing is not to go into it with a rock solid plan, because these things are, like every element of that structure is is really critical to get right and to get as right as possible. Because once you launch it, you sort of you know it's hard to it's hard to change things. Right. Um, and um, so, so so you know I, I that's that's one of the reasons why talking to your group is 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 uh, and sharing it with on the YouTube video on your channel it was appealing to me because it's the kind of leaders thought leaders that that. I, you need in the early stages to make sure you don't fumble the ball on something like this. Right. And, Which, uh, I mean, one thing that you might click with is modern monetary theory, which is um, this, you know, kind of uh, in the U.S. at least, it's 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 kind of on the left. So you know, a uh, uh, AOC, for example, and other politicians like some of Bernie Sanders economic advisors subscribe to modern monetary theory and it's it's an under it's a reconceptualization of debt and the foundation for the value of money um and it, and it would seem to have some overlap here with the way you might think about an entity like you're describing yeah, or a I'm set not, of social I'm, entities I'm, yeah i'm not aware of that <clears throat> but the idea is just that uh countries create their own cash and it's not based on anything except its use and so as long as you're using a currency, then it's worth something. And you can create as much or as little as you want. Um, and you can right. cancel your own debt, for example, right? There's no way a country can go bankrupt because they control the currency. So right. it's a way to move away from kind of Thatcher, Reaganite, 
air, you know, this, this understanding of a control of debt, a control of the monetary system based on having to pay it back through taxation, when in fact you can pay back debt through the generation of currency. And so, right, right. and so you can never go bankrupt <laughs> because who do you owe money to? Like you're, you control the production of yeah. cash. So anyway, yeah, but I just think that's why it's really, it's really incredible that uh, decentralized finance in all of its val values and virtues, which is beyond, beyond, you know, I don't even, uh, I don't understand uh, all of it, but I understand these concepts that you're saying that, that are the salient points of those, of, of those coins. Mm. Um, right. Cause if you can generate those and if everyone uses them because they're a part of the network, then that gives them value. Yeah, yeah, and what's the network? So there's there's two sort of there's phases of of bringing something like this to life to get from where we are now to billions of people using an app. It's different phases, and there's different needs to get that to go up the ramp and then to stabilize. But once you're at the top of the ramp, you don't actually all your cryptocurrency is mined. Then you then it's all you know it's a flourishing. Uh, economy essentially yeah and uh and, and and institutionally speaking the only thing you need is you need exchanges with yeah. outside materials and social goods so you would just whatever obviously you generate there you would just have to have an exchange for u.s right. dollars and, or and, and, or anything and then you and then you decentralize amazon essentially at some point you you, you those that's how you do it you get people in a network using an altcoin prevalently to the point that people start just you know building the, the building of a system to post goods and to uh, uh, buy goods could be all done in the network, and then Amazon turns into a fulfillment center as a business. Right, right, and 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 we give Jeff Bezos his wish to go live on the moon. <laughs> exactly. <Right. laughs> <laughs> but but I mean uh, the decentralization is coming for every centralized company. It's come it's coming, and, and it's going. It, you know it's it's going to sort of overtake little enclaves and little enclaves until it becomes this massive force that you you're not going to be able to compete with it in, in a centralized thought process. I, that's my feeling right now. I, I don't see how in the long run a centralized system is going to be able to compete with a decentralized system yeah i mean they're they, they might be good at different things but i yeah. but i hear what you're saying in the long run you know I, it's a question though i mean we're seeing it also play out geopolitically you know with for example the rise of china it's like well can you run a country efficiently in such a centralized kind of non undemocratic non-democratic way um but yeah. yeah, I mean, they might be good at different things. I mean, they can exist alongside each other. It's, it's a lot of speculation, of course. That's we're talking mm. a lot of a lot of chain reaction has to occur to get to that end point where where my statement holds true. But that's just my gut feeling right now. When you when you see all the value that comes out of it, and uh, it just seems like a force that would be hard to reckon with. Hi guys, um, my okay. name's Cameron. I'm, I'm from Victoria University in Australia. Um, okay. um, I did philosophy before before delving into machine learning, so it's really interesting what, you, <laughs> what you're talk, talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it sounds like what you're describing is is sort of an independent, self-governing cooperative where you will elect leaders. So they could be Trumpites, or they could be BLM, or whatever, and the value, whatever the values of the elected leaders are the ones that are enforced in this, in this network. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you would have some 4chans and, or um, whatever. Um, yeah, getting, getting the governance right for the leadership is, is critical too. And that's a whole separate line of thought and philosophy and in and, and, and construction of a, essentially a constitution. Yeah, because you can't have Kanye West running it based on likes, right? <laughs> <No>. I mean... <laughs> Um, but you, you were saying it, whatever it is, it will likely be better than what we have now. That's the nice thing. It's a, well, it's a very low that's the bar. other thing. We're in Australia where trust in the state isn't at zero yet, I guess. Um, yeah, right. Well, but, yeah. 
our, our we've got yeah um but so you you were saying before that um data is is the all important thing it's the fuel for m machine learning and so you still need these huge data centers how do you manage storage and how do you take because you still have the state and capital controlling these things and and um regulating speech can you decentralize storage or how do you get the data yeah, out of the hands of the state and of political actors like cambridge analytica and so on yeah um i i didn't present on that just in the interest of time because there, there is a what i envision happening is that um well first of all let me tell you right right now the social networks that are decentralized that already exist they're they're sort of more of an anarchy solution where where there's no moderation there's no ability to block like you you can personally block other people but you, you can't there's no central are they bot, no central bot problems what are they bot problems is it just flooded with you know uh you know i, I haven't state. looked in it bot i don't know problem. if any of them have bots uh or that each of them is different but um um the, okay so each of them is different but at the end it's just a decentralized network of of users what i'm th what i'm thinking about that might make sense for this solution is to not have it and not have users join the social network directly but have an intermediate layer of of of, of, a, of some sort of brick and mortar institution through which you join the network maybe a church or a bar or a library, something like that, that's, that, that, that is a stakeholder in the community that has a community already and invites their, and, and users can join into the network through a community that they already participate in. And, and, and you, you could essentially uh, use some of that, you, you could do good for the local organization too so through through whatever membership you join the network and then there's a moderation there where the lo each local organization has some mo some moderator uh capabilities of its own members a a the, the 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 decentralized uh uh autonomous organization the da the dow's leaders those leaders only have power to control the purse they have power to control the the open source project but they do not have power to control the the instances of the of the nodes in the network it's a decentralized network so so there's no centralized control of the operation of of the thing they can set the tone they can set the they can set the rules uh, they can set the rules by which you uh, by which to, uh, a decentralized organization can join the network and um, let me think about this. Yeah, yeah, it, it gets a little more complicated, but but something along those lines. Uh, the the core concept is is that you could potentially introduce this intermediate layer uh, of, of an organization that that does some of the moderation uh, beneath it. And creates and, and is also a, a convenient way to rapidly be able to go to market and get users into the network. And they could also sort of maintain the the computing infrastructure for the thing for their users, which might which might be just a, a you know an instance in AWS, but it's it's a private instance that the that the, that the local organization control isn't it as a political as a political theory isn't that anarcho syndicalism i think that's which was popular kind of in the early 20th century um anarcho syndicalism uh and oh, noam chomsky was a big proponent of um i think a, a, and probably still is uh for yeah. the next however, yeah, however I, long yeah the problem is as yeah, similar to the system we have now, I guess, that you need check checks and balances and yeah. distribution of power, and there's nothing, nothing perfect. So there is no perfect solution. Yeah, and it can't just be a popularity contest because you need 
Um, I mean, look, you know, you know, what's interesting is like, <clears throat> if you think from a, like a political theory standpoint, what, what people want is they want some form of representation. So if you want true democratic forms, you need representation. And we have a science of representation, it's called statistics, you know, and so, we, you know, we can do sampling and, um, and, and we understand the basis on which we can do that and the manner in which we should do that in order to create representative governance mechanisms. But nobody seems to want to cede control over, over democratic processes to something that's rational and actually would, yeah. you know, because it's actually- Well, it's, it's, limited, it's limited what, what um, an algorithm can effectively, like it can't, they can't understand human language. So you can't, um, and they won't in our life, well, they won't affect, you know, they'll pick up, they can pick up a list of words that are banned, but, but it can right. independently <laughs> enforce some, some things which people would go for, I, I guess. Yeah, you'd have to figure out um, like how a, to do representation. Have a constitution that is enforced by a, <laughs> by a, um, algo. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, that, I mean, uh, I agree with that statement, but you could, but what you could do is attempt to do, attempt it in seasons. So it, you, the board comes up with its best shot at some smart contract that governs the thing that doesn't, uh, for a season, we learn from that, we iteratively improve. Um, that, that, that's an option, you, you know. That's yeah, or the market, that the go, market goes somewhere better if it's not working out. Yeah. What? Or the market abandons them and goes somewhere better if it's not working out. Exactly. Exactly. Well, John, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really cool, uh, yeah. and uh, and we really appreciate uh, uh, your time. Um, I'll pop this up. I'll do obviously a little <laughs> editing of those little parts where uh, we had some yeah. technical glitches, but um, but thanks for this kind of broad-reaching talk and. Uh, and 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 the stimulation the mental stimulation <laughs> that it's provided it's, it's definitely fun to think about I, I hope i hope you guys think about it and if anyone wants to reach out with me with a, a post talk uh, dialogue i'm happy to happy to entertain that cool thank you so much and uh and and have a great evening over there in atlanta all right thank you very much thank you cheers <laughs>